All right. The first question that we have, uh, the seabed and foreshore case was something quite significant that you were involved in. Did the court case ease tensions, and was it a fair outcome? Uh, which outcome? <laughs> Ours or over the road? Um, was it a, uh, did it ease tensions? I'm not sure that I could. Well, no, it didn't, did it? <laughs> uh, it was, uh, I suppose it was inevitable that it would take time for the, um, for for that case to be absorbed. Um, personally, I think perhaps it could have, uh, a little bit more time could have taken before reflex, but then I'm not a politician and I'm sure that the strains to look as if um, uh, that was uh, under control were pretty intense. Um, that was, I mean, that was a break, that case. That, that, that's an example of the sort of case I say that you, you really rather don't have those cases. Um, if there was anywhere to hide, you would. Um, but, no, it did, it did uh, raise tensions. But, you know, that's perhaps a process we have to be going through in this country, and I'm sure we've got through... Uh, that and um, we hope we won't encounter, well I won't encounter uh, uh, many more like that anyway. But I, I mean I was perfectly happy with the case which I thought legally speaking was in fact quite a conservative um, decision even if people hadn't been prepared for it. If you knew and it's what I say, that we've forgotten a lot of our own legal history, that it was such a surprise, really. Today, a report said that 50% of Māori and Pacifica men born in, question mark, 1988, have a criminal record. From your side of the bench, does this seem accurate? Why do we have such a depressing statistic in our country? Uh, from my side of the bench, that does seem accurate. Um, and as to why, oh, that's the big question for our country. We need to address that because it's not something we can continue to live with. As I suggested in my remarks earlier, I think we are uh, at risk of criminalising a distinct population. And if that perception uh, is accurate, then we do have, I think, recipe for civic disorder. So I think we need to address it. You've said that institutions are central to protecting the rule of law, but what if the institutions themselves are under threat, as we've seen in the US, with the attacks on the judiciary and the media? How can the judiciary respond to direct attacks on institutions of justice by politicians? Well, that really was the burden of my remarks, that I think in our institutions are fragile. Uh, they depend on popular support. So our job is to do our job and to explain why we come to the decisions we do and hope that the public values that. We can't fight back in any other way. Uh, we can't sort of hire publicists. Um, uh, we really have to, as I think Lord Denning once said, our judgments have to be their own vindication. And if they aren't, well, then we have to work harder at them. Is a supreme codified constitution desirable to bring greater legal certainty and better protect rights in New Zealand? Uh, I don't think so, really, if we understand our constitution and if we're prepared to work at it, because an unwritten constitution does require that sort of commitment. My main question about that is whether there is enough social glue, whether we share enough um, uh, heritage, uh, particularly as our population changes, for us to feel that it is sufficient to have an unwritten, well, largely unwritten, we do have fragments uh, of, of writing uh, which are constitutional, but a largely unwritten constitution. If 
We don't know what the Constitution is, which is really why I wanted to talk about it tonight. If we don't know what it is, then it can be imperceptibly eroded very easily. And there are constantly um, changes that are being brought about which do impinge on constitutional fundamentals. I'm sure they're not done by design. I think it's just that people don't understand that they do trench on rights. Uh, question. I disagree with your characterisation of New Zealand's constitution as fragile. Unwritten constitutions have proven more robust at adapting to the rigours of the advancements in society than many, if not all, written constitutions. Do you think that parliamentary sovereignty is adequate as a constitutional safeguard? Um, well... They've, they, only survive, they only survive in two places. Uh, that is um, New Zealand and the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom is in the throes of probably becoming a federation, which will mean it will have uh, a, a, a written constitution to some extent. Once you have federalism, you have um, a more rigid separation of the different functions in the state, and from those, there are a lot of implicit values that, uh, you can see that in Australia. Australia's got a pretty rudimentary constitution. What they have is a strict separation of powers, and from that, a lot flows. Um, so, but, so when you say, when, when it is said that our system has been robust, um, I mean, I do believe in an evolutionary constitution. I think it's actually the, the sensible... Uh, well, it's, 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 been, it's been able to respond to changes in society extremely well. But that is not the perception of most countries. Uh, we are almost on our own in that, and perhaps we have to start um, asking whether we should be so confident, particularly if, as I suspect is the case, most people couldn't really describe the uh, New Zealand constitution. So I, my query is whether we can afford uh, present constitutional arrangements, but it doesn't fill me with any joy to think we might adopt a written constitution, because once you get hard-edged like that, um, you, um, you know, it's a complex thing. I don't know any ideal constitution, and of course there's no constitutional document that is complete in itself. You, it always has um, a common law uh, a feature or a, um, uh, an unwritten aspect. How far do you think we've come in sexism within law compared to where you think we should be? Well, it's not a very good time to, to, uh, to be thinking about that, is it? I mean, I had thought we'd come a lot further. I'd never thought that all the barriers were down. Um, and I'm dismayed at um, what's come out about attitudes in the profession. I think that it is not surprising with some of those attitudes that women are not getting ahead. Uh, it's... Um, uh, there is a cultural impediment, I think, that we need to face up to within the profession. A judge's ruling can often become a case study for future rulings. Does this ever impact your final decisions, and if so, in what way? Nope. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, you don't, I don't think you write for... I mean, occasionally you might be writing for... Um, particularly when you write a dissent, hoping that um, some of the ideas may stay around and, and be picked up. But I don't think you ever write to be a case study. Um, uh, you're, either, you're writing to try and convince uh, readers, but, uh, perhaps, but no, I've never thought about be ending up in a case book. It'd be nice, actually, now I come to think of it. <laughs> Are there any ideological winds blowing through non-statute law, brackets, para-law, that worry you? Uh, ooh. Uh, 
Uh, well, I mean, it's like anything really. You, you have to have, one of the good things about uh, judicial decisions is that every judge exercises independent judgment. Um, there is no party line. I'm always a little bit nervous if there is a party line, and I'm always nervous about fashion. And you do see fashion in judgments. I couldn't pretend that you don't. Uh, so whether those are ideological, sometimes they have been. The Victorian judges, it was said, used to see a Bill of Rights protective of property uh, in the Constitution, and they used that to strictly construe statutes which interfered with property. Um, it may be that there are similar, um, I mean, people do have values. Uh, one just hopes that they are thought through and tough values uh, which are held because that's, uh, you know, the, because of that, because they've been argued through rather than being what is the received wisdom. How is the law preparing to deal with artificial intelligence and what do you think the impact will be? Well, look, I'm retiring in March. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very pleased. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm sure there are those in the audience who know much more about it um, than I am. I mean, I, I, I do find it hard to believe that evaluation and... Um, values are things that we are not going to require humans to provide uh, in a just society. So I'm not terribly worried about lawyers. I think transactional work um, may be a bit different. Uh, there, there will have to be adjustments there, but I think at the thinking end, um, uh, oh, I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> Look, I know there's lots of thinking goes into transactions. Um, uh, and I couldn't do one. <laughs> it's a different way of thinking. Uh, but I'm sure, well, if there, if there is, then I'm sure that transactional work will flourish too. It seems that the court of public opinion is more active and powerful than ever through social media and the desire for large corporations to seem to be in line with perceived public opinion. Do you see this development as a threat to the rule of law? What is the court's role in this new context? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think public opinion is a threat. That, that's really to disparage people um, a bit. I think we, we do see uh, fashions, we do see people being led. I, I, I don't... What was the second part of the question? Uh, what is the court's role in this What's the context? court's role in public opinion? Well, again, I think our only role is to do what our job is. It's only to write, the, to, to come to decision and to hope to convince, which is why I think the expression of the reasons for decision is so important. I suppose you have to worry that people may not read uh, them, um, uh, but then that's probably our fault if they're, if they're so opaque too. But then we, we, we do need to be more effective communicators. I do agree with that. The Free Speech Coalition recently raised $50,000 to take Phil Goff to court in defence of free speech. How equitable is access to justice for those who can't raise that money for equally important cases, do you think? Well, it's a huge issue, access to justice. Um, uh, and, um, and it's something that we need to address. It's not just questions of legal aid. There are all sorts of other um, impediments, uh, I think the scale of fees may be one of the problems we just need to look at. Um, what um, other ways of delivering legal advice uh, to people. Um, but I, I suppose I'm a bit of a 
a purist, really, you know, one of those who says that the, the courts are open to everyone like the Ritz. Um, uh, I think it's important that they're open. Um, it is true, and we've got to acknowledge that not everybody can go through those doors. Uh, well, they can go through those doors. So they can't go through them effectively, but an awful lot of important litigation has been one to establish critical points in our history by people with very little uh, in the way of resources. And I think the fact that the courts are open is the critical thing. Uh, yes, we've got to work on making sure that people who need legal representation are able to obtain it, and we need to think of more creative ways to do that. But it's really important that we keep those doors open, even if it does look like the Ritz. When you stress the importance of, quote, preserving civility and disagreement, what do you make of the debate over free speech in recent weeks and how the debate, or otherwise, has played out? Um, I haven't really been following it uh, very closely. It seemed to be very excited, really. Um, uh, I, I, I do think uh, freedom of speech is a, a very important principle. Um, I apply it across the board. It's why I think, actually, the adversary system is a really good system, and we should be very careful b before we throw it over, because you can raise any point you want to raise. Um, I think that, um, yes, there have to be some limits to freedom of speech, but they have to be ones that are imposed for principled reasons, like disruption of public order and... Um, um, matters like that um, and yes uh, it didn't really look terribly edifying what I saw about some of the recent um, events because I think people should, should be able to be heard Do you think we as a nation will ever reach a point that the treaty is entrenched in law? Um, well the treaty is entrenched in law, really. I mean, you cannot escape the fact that that is the foundation of uh, the New Zealand legal order. Uh, what you may, and, and it's clearly not a legal nullity. It has effect in international law. Indeed, there was an international law, uh, uh, arbitration which said it was a valid treaty of session and it appears in the treaty series. What we make of it is something for our society to work on. Your evident concern for fairness and ensuring people coming before a judge feel they are being heard and treated fairly, what processes do judges as a group have in place to evaluate their performance in achieving such fairness? Well, as I said, one of the things about impartiality and um, the independence which supports impartiality is that judges are free of direction from other judges, including the Chief Justice, and that's a really important principle. So we don't have party lines on, uh, on these sort of things, and, um, and I wouldn't like to see them. But we do try to we do try to keep abreast with you know the ideas um, uh, and the knowledge that might help us, but we don't impose those standards on on other judges. But we, we have a lot of judicial um, education among mm. ourselves. You said in your speech a few times, quote, the court must have the trust of the community. What does this mean? What does it look like? I think the court has to be trust... Uh, I think we need the community's trust. Um, uh, I think that's the way I put it. 
Um, but I suppose you're right. Uh, well, I suppose the question is right, but we also should trust the community. And we do in law. We have lots of standards, which it is for juries to apply or where you're applying the standard of the reasonable man or something like that. We are meant to be grounded in the values of our society, and we do, I think, need to stay close to them. Will the judiciary be globalised in response to massive issues of justice like climate change? How might this work in practice? Well, I'd... I don't see the judiciary globalising. Um, maybe that's a... Uh, I mean, there are uh, uh, international uh, legal institutions, of course, but they are pretty underformed. Uh, perhaps that's what the question's directed at. And yes, one can see that things that require a wider community than a national community uh, to address effectively, and climate change could well be one, are ones where we can expect international institutions to develop further. Dame Shan, you're the patron for the Centre of Ethics at Diocesan and we're involved with its establishment. How do you see that influencing law and good community decision making? Well, I think any civic education is to be applauded. I think any um, educational initiatives that attempt to um, encourage young people to think about the values of our society are important in inculcating um, uh, shared values and shared values are what support law. There are currently 60% female law graduates but fewer than 30% in senior roles in the profession. Do you have any comments on what it will take to right the balance at the top? This bothers me a great deal because when I entered the profession, I really did think that when I had grandchildren who are the age of my granddaughters, uh, we would be laughing at uh, some of the impediments there were for women. And that is not the case. It's still not a laughing matter. Um, so. I do think the profession needs to look at itself, but maybe it's a bigger social issue too. I mean, presumably, the clients um, uh, are also not uh, particularly welcoming to women. I personally think it's time for women to get really angry. I think women uh, in the legal profession, I have said this to women's groups, I think women in the legal profession should really look at the uh, place uh, where they're working. If they feel that they are not sufficiently valued, if they feel they're not getting a fair crack, I think they should leave. I think they should... There, are, uh, there, there is great work to be done out there. There may be lower incomes, but actually I think people are trapped by the unrealistic incomes in legal practice today. Uh, and uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of young people are on treadmills where the work they're doing is quite unworthwhile. Uh, and when I started off in legal practice, I, there, there were, I mean, we, we did some cases which were amazing. There are people out there who need help. There are really good careers out there to be made, and I think if women are not enjoying the lives that they've got in the profession, they should regroup and do it themselves. And I have said this to women's groups. This is a mixed group, but... Uh, uh, um, I think we haven't learned the lesson of the suffragettes. Um, they knew that getting the vote wasn't the end. There was no point in getting the, the vote so that affluent women could get a bigger share of the spoils. Um, well, that's the, you know, or, or you know, our aim of getting into law was not so that affluent women could get a bigger share of the spoils. The suffragettes wanted to change the world. Well, I think. It's time for women to be ambitious enough to want to change the world they're in. (laughs) 
you said that rule of law uh, requires great labour. What does that mean in practice for the general public? Well, it requires labour of its practitioners. I think it requires effort of those who would uh, understand it. Uh, it may be a council of per perfection or uh, over-optimistic to think that people would want to read judgments, but I would hope that they would want to understand uh, the, the elements of our legal order and... That does take a little effort. What have been some of the highlights of your time as Chief Justice and your career generally? Uh, somebody, oh, actually, when I went to, um, to a school, uh, one of the girls, they were quite young. Um, this was my granddaughter, who was very, is very proud of the fact that I'm Chief Justice. She, I think I'm part, she really doesn't want me to retire, because I think, I think it's part of her social standing. Um, <laughs> Anyway, she persuaded me to go along and talk to a bunch of eight-year-olds, and they, they, gave so, they asked me such good questions, and one of them said to me, what's, what's the case you're proudest of? Which really floored me, and I said, oh, it's actually the last case you decide, because you're so thrilled that you managed to come to a conclusion. Um, but they, they didn't think that was a very satisfactory answer. Um, uh, in the, I am pleased about the setting up of the Supreme Court. I think it was over time. And it's going to take a while. In fact, I had this in my um, written uh, paper, which I'll make available, of course, and I didn't read it out. But um, I think it is going to take time to settle that institution in. It's a work of generations, probably, uh, a number of generations anyway. Um, but I'm very pleased uh, that it was done. It gives us an opportunity to develop our own voice and to concentrate on areas of our law that never had a look in when we had second appeals to the Privy Council because there was not enough money involved. So I think it has actually improved access to justice. There were criminal cases, never went, one or two. Um, family law cases, apart from relationship property cases involving a lot of money. There were, there were lots of ACC cases, things like that. So I think it has helped access to justice, and I'm proud of that uh, institution. Um, the other one may sound absolutely trivial, but when I was when I was sworn in as Chief Justice, I was absolutely determined we were going to do away with the spaniel's ears wigs and the red robes. Uh, in which judges are always caricatured, you know. So all the cartoons show us in that. And we've done it. And we've uh, developed a, uh, what I think is a fabulous gown. It's, it's a traditional gown. It's the Tudor gown. Um, but we did it in a fabric, and it was done by the gown makers, so it's authentic. It has a beautiful jacquard um, black on black design on the gown fabric, which is, it, it's a repeating kari cone. It's gorgeous. And then we had um, uh, potamu um, panels, potama, is it, sorry, panels, the stepping uh, design uh, in in um, red and gold and on the black, and we have on our arms the three baskets of knowledge. So it speaks of our country, I think, and our twin heritage. And I'm pleased we've done that. It's a symbol, and symbols sometimes matter. Thank you. Thank you.